Good morning, good morning, good morning for a very wet March morning in the UK. Oh, yes. don't need that now. Need heater on hot and on the windscreen. Here we go. Gonna go the windy way, leaving on time. Windscreen wipers working. You can see how wet it is, can't you? I'm not going left, because you know what lies left, don't you? The great flood of Nash Road. That's what he's going through. Look at where the tractor's bashed all the edges here. And over in this road to the right. Anyway, I hope you're well. Just my brakes. That's brave, isn't it? Cycling to work on a day like today. You have to be really dedicated. Right, okay, I think we've got everything. Oh no, I'm gonna to have to leave the windscreen wipers on. So, it's Friday, so I only work Friday morning, so I've only got like three or four patients in probably. I think I've got a bridge fit and some other stuff. I was, um, all on the news this morning is that uh, the, the, uh, the economy has grown by 0.3%. So goodness knows who's inventing those figures. And uh, I mean, it's probably off a very low base, isn't it? It's probably off an extremely depressed economic activity. So we're just off the bottom, you know. So I wanted to talk to you about, uh, well, a bunch of things really that all tie together that will help you improve your model really of um, how the world works and it all started with childcare and uh, there's a big uh, hoo-ha this morning about the fact that we've got the most expensive childcare in Europe or something and that it's impeding people's return to work and it's a problem because um, Rishi Sunak is the uh, erstwhile Prime Minister who used to be the Chancellor of the Exchequer for a long time uh, is complaining that uh, you know we're not uh, productive enough as a country. Our productivity is very low, but, but it always has been. You know, I mean, this is nothing new. The English have always been pretty unproductive, and there's a lot of theories for that. I personally think that they have decided that they don't fancy working, and so they they're happy enough. You know, I've always said my mum far richer than my mother was. I, I even if I had never worked another day, I'd still. Be, have a quality of life which is far in excess of anything she had and so how far do you go you know how far do you carry on uh, and also there is the um, there's the other uh, thing which is like the British working class which has got a, a well-known policy of uh, constructive uh, un 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 disengagement with employers uh, whenever things aren't going as well as they'd like so you know if they feel they're being hard done by or uh, not being paid enough or not getting enough holiday or enough respect or whatever then they'll just go on and they'll go on a go slow and that is the normal state of affairs for the british working man is a go slow so <laughs> and then lastly i think that um they're working in an environment which is pretty which is not conducive to high productivity you know uh we are inundated with rules, regulations, uh, inspection, testing, compliance issues. And so uh, it's, you know, I, for example, I have decided, even though I'm, I would be rewarded 130% for any capital that I invested in, if it was working productive capital, like suppose I bought a new APG machine or something, and it cost me a hundred grand, then I would get 130,000 pound back. But the problem is that I wouldn't get it back in time to pay for the machine. And also, you know, I haven't got the profit or the uh, inclination to take on 
at the age of 63, 100,000 pounds worth of debt to pay for a machine that I might only get two years use out of, you know, and then have to sell it. Um, and and even if I did, you know, I'm not going to, you know, 130 pounds, pounds worth of tax relief is not any use to me because I'm, you know, if I pay, if I have to pay 10,000 pounds tax in a year, I get upset because I, and that's because I have adjusted my way of working to ensure that I stay comfortable and yet don't earn large amounts of money because I can't see the point of paying large amounts of tax. I know the Chancellor would like to think that I, you know, I'm happy to contribute to uh, the, whatever folly the government is spending on, but um, quite honestly, I've given them a, enough tax in my lifetime and I don't intend to carry on as a cash cow until I drop dead. So, and this, you know, this all contributes to lack of productivity because then I'm sitting there with one dentist, one nurse, one receptionist, and I'm busy enough, certainly, for two dentists and uh, uh, two full-time equivalent receptionists and uh, two uh, full-time equivalent nurses plus a, a hygienist. I could expand easily, but I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I will not. <laughs> so, uh, in a way, I suppose... <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm contributing to the government's uh, lack of productivity, and I'm happy to contribute towards it um, because I'm not, you know, I'm not going to work the way they want me to work. This is uh, the Homo Economicus. You know, I make decisions which are in in my best interests all the time, and. The reason why there's no childcare is because the restrictions placed on uh, people who wish to provide childcare have just got to the point of, of being stupid. I mean, you know, I mean, literally, the inspection, the testing, the compliance. When my uh, grandson went to play school, uh, after a term, we, we got back a whole book about what he'd been up to, what he'd learned every day and with pictures and everything and it was clear to me that not only was the uh, nursery teacher you know, walking around like uh, Mount Batten with a camera around her neck the whole day taking pictures of everybody but the amount of work that must have been required just to upload these pictures uh, and the post-production you know turn them into a storybook and write the story and everything must have been at least equivalent to the amount of time it took to care for the children. And they, you know, you, you're, you're, this is not supportable. You cannot provide ten, pound, 10 pounds worth of childcare for a fiver. And that's what they need to do. They need to provide something that people can buy for a fiver, not, not uh, have to bump up their, what they spend to a tenner. So, those of you who listen to my podcast on a regular basis understand what I'm saying there. It's not supportable in an economic sense. It's not uh, in a catalyst free market sense. Um, if you want to act as a collectivist and say that, you know, that you know on behalf of the group better than the group does what they need to do and how they need to organise things, then you're on a hiding to nothing, you know. Uh, CF uh, Union, uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics or uh, Mao's China or Pol Pot's Vietnam, you know, any any of these. Pol Pot Vietnam? I think he was. No, I don't think he was. Anyway. Um, that, I mean, you see my point though, right? You know, collectivism is, is it's a series of people who think that they know uh, better than everybody else and when in fact they don't. And as Mark Twain said, he said, well, it's not what you don't know, that's the problem. He said, it's what you know for certain that just ain't so. And these people know a lot for certain that just ain't so. And as a result, we all suffer. Now when uh, the government, uh, and there is a hierarchy in this, you know, there's me, then above me, there's the Department of Health, and above the Department of Health, there's the Health Select Committee, and above them is the House of Commons. Um, 
and when uh, there's a governance crisis, which is what there is, and as I've always stated, that you know, the whole thing is uh, rotten from the top down, really. That the everything goes wrong. Everything goes wrong. So you get, uh, you, you know, you start fighting expensive foreign wars. Your nursery service collapses. Your dental service collapses. The courts collapse. A and E collapses. Everything collapses because, and it's all for the same reason, which is that the governance, the governance model is wrong. That is that the uh, uh, Department of Health is not held accountable by the Health Select Committee properly. That the Health Select Committee is not held accountable by the Commons properly. And um, the Commons really has got no, uh, it's got this collectivist approach that whatever they think is best for the country is best for the country. So, you know, in, in thinking what, in thinking, you know, who contributed to the lack of NHS dentistry in this country, in the, in, you know, or even who contributed to the lack of, um, Childcare, or uh, sorry, junction of death. Here we go. Who contributed to the lack of um, elderly care homes and stuff like that? The collapse of Southern Cross. Um, you know, there, there is a long and distinguished roll call of people who had a chance to play their part. <coughs> and played it incorrectly. So, I mean, everyone knows I've got a particular fondness for Barry Cockcroft as the architect of the, uh, the Dental Desert. But he was assisted by uh, Chris Audrey, the senior civil servant at the time, the two of them, like Laurel and Hardy, at every meeting. Um, uh, Michael Watson, who worked for the GDPA, who defected to the BDA and uh, contributed to the downfall of the sort of the only independent voice on behalf of the general practitioner. Um, you'd have to include people like Brian Mawinney in that, the, the Minister of State for Health in the 90s. Uh, Ken Bloomfield, who wrote the report. Jimmy Steele. Um, you know, it's a bit like the Oscars, isn't it? I mean, so everybody at the BDA who knows me. <laughs> This is my roll call of disaster and doom and, and everybody, but it's like I had someone coming yesterday and, and I said to her, she had really severe toothache and I said to her, look, every time you eat something sweet, you get toothache. But the trouble is you don't get it for half an hour. You you eat it at 11 o'clock and you get severe toothache at half past 11 and you know you don't connect the two because there's a, a disconnect, there's a delay. Um, but I said, it's the, you know, if you've got decayed teeth, a lot of decayed teeth, you have to put yourself on a sugar-free diet. So, and it's the same with these people. They are individually and collectively responsible for the collapse of the dental service in toto. Uh, you know, and that includes people like Keith Ostelow, uh, all the major names, uh, Lawrence Lando, all the, all the major names of the past sort of 30 years, they, they've all, who had a responsibility, had it, were in a position of power, who were in, the, in a position to do something, uh, did, the, did nothing or did the wrong thing, didn't understand what they were needed to do, which was basically, in most cases, just nothing. Um, and they are now either dead or retired, you know, the system that they produced, this, this dental desert system, is now in fully in effect, and they are they are gone. They're not around to uh, to be held accountable for the consequences of the mismanagement of the service uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So the only solution really is to try and fix the governance system. You know, to have some form of um, uh, certainly, I would uh, I would say the biggest thing is to move away from this collectivist way of thinking into a more um, free market way of thinking, whereby 
the dentists uh, are able to um, run the system in a way which they know will work. And we've got a very famous park in Margate called Dreamland. And Dreamland fell into disrepair, was bought up by the council, made a massive loss, still making a massive loss for all I know. And um, uh, the guy who I bought my surgery off, Colin Logan, whose father worked at Dreamland for a long time, said that the best thing they could do with it is give it back, give it back to the travellers, you know, the people who run fairs and who know how to make money out of fairs. And that's what you need to do. You need to... The, the way I look at it is this. You know, I know that there's a big obsession with data-driven analysis and uh, and that's really because it favours the academics. The academics who've never run a dental surgery in their life, who, who couldn't run a dental surgery profitably and don't know anything about running a dental surgery, right, that's the, uh, that's the dictionary definition of an academic. <coughs> well, you can go. I'll let you go. They, um, they like data-driven uh, analysis because um, it elevates them above the, the actual people who can do the job um, at the various uh, forums, where, which is where they you know, get their money. Uh, the, um, the meetings, the committee meetings, and the, you know, the, the, the uh, administration side of running the business. They, um, they're very prey to uh, the representatives from Johnson & Johnson, for example, who make Durafat. Because if you can come up with a single study that shows that Durafat uh, applied to a million people reduced decay in one tooth in one of them, they call that a data-driven uh, study and, and therefore yeah, all of a sudden Uh, everybody in the NHS dental service is told to prescribe Durafat for everybody who's got any decay. It's mainly shocking, isn't it? It's a good job it's not cold or it'll be snow. You know, and oral B are the same, Procter and Gamble. They're just uh, trying to shift toothbrushes and if they can get a fat contract with an NHS England to um, give away, or NHS Scotland more like, to give away toothbrushes to everybody. That's profit, you know, they don't sell these brushes at a loss. They don't donate these brushes. NHS Scotland donates the brushes and, and they pay for them. But if I was in a plane that was hurtling towards the ground, I'd be in possession of a lot of data. The vertical speed indicator would be firmly downwards. The airspeed indicator would be accelerating. The altimeter will be spiraling backwards. We'll let you go, matey, because you've got a big. What's it, haven't you? Yeah, he's just dropped off a load of refugees. That's the refugee camp down there. Oh, I bet they love coming to the UK, don't you, when the weather's like this? I bet they wish they were all back in Albania, or Syria, or wherever they were in the sun, or stayed in France. They could have stayed in France, couldn't they, and claimed asylum there. Uh, lived in Montpellier, or Nice. It doesn't, turn, it doesn't take much to learn French, I tell you, it's, a, it's not a complicated language. 10,000 words of French and you're fine. So you're in this crashing plane, right? The instruments are going balmy, right? The, <laughs> the altimeter's going down. <coughs> the airspeed is going up. The ending temperature's falling. The, end, the, the uh, propeller RPM is, is racing. You've got plenty of data, but what do you want to do? You want to have a word with the pilot, don't you? You want to say to the pilot, excuse me, you know, can you save this plane? Can you fly this plane 
and stop us crashing. But the, the academics and the people at the Department of Health who run everything, they're not interested in talking to the pilot. They just want more data. They just want more data. They want to make a, do some sort of uh, uh, prediction, statistical prediction on the altimeter to see whether they're going to hit the ground and if so, roughly when, you know. And, <laughs> and then you'll have the Department of Health comms department saying, well, we can, uh, you know, this altitude is being calculated in meters. We could probably show it in feet, which would look a lot bigger and be a lot less scary, you know. So, <laughs> talk to the pilot. That's what I would say. Don't look at the data. The pilot knows instinctively what the data is doing. The pilot is used to using the data to reach the high level decisions about what needs to be done. I'm really annoyed that I might have left somebody out of this role of shame. They're playing golf in the pouring rain. Who have I left out? Who have I left? I've covered the BDA, haven't I? I've covered pretty much the department of health. Did I do Rosie Winterton? I think I might have done. Edwina Curry, I would put in that. Um, the guy, uh, which the Consumers Association, I think, contributed it through their their assistance in the in the uh, procurement of the Three Bears Porridge, the UDA system. And uh, the General Dental Council for uh, completely missing the ball and deciding that it's their job to try and strike off every dentist. You know, and every dentist that comes up before them is, is obviously a wrong one, and it's their job to make sure that they don't get back on the register and and to do things like uh, you know make sure you stay off the register if you're half an hour late with your your, uh, your fee and to bump fees up and uh, the care quality commission I would say deserves a special mention I would say they deserve a lifetime award because they don't inspect the quality of care, okay? Sorry, sit down if you're gonna listen to this. They don't inspect the quality of care. They just inspect your paperwork. They're a paperwork quality commission. They don't look at anything you do. They don't look at a filling. They don't check your drills are sharp. They don't check your, you know, they, they, they check you've got uh, a sterilizer and that it's, you've got the paperwork's in order, but they don't check to see if you're using it or if it's, um, you know, if, if it's, uh, as soon as they go, it's turned off and put back in the drawer, in the cupboard. They just check your paperwork and certification on the basis that if you're up to date with your certificates, then you're a good, and in the same way as someone, you know, if, you, if I took someone for a ride in my plane, and they said to me, well, you know, before I go, I need, uh, can you send me a copy of your pilot's license and the, um, your MOT for the plane, your logbooks and stuff like that, just, uh, and your radio telephony license, because um, my insurers want that. And I'd be like, okay, but that doesn't mean that I'm a good pilot. Do you know what I mean? You know, ask, uh, ask uh, Sally, the footballer, if being, uh, certified and up to date with your registration means that you're, you're, you're a good pilot. It's Mohammed, isn't it? Mohammed Salah. These lorries, they park here, they're waiting for the construction. So much construction going on around here. I mean, personally, I don't mind. I think it's good. I think the house prices need to come down and, the, and it's a simple case of supply and demand. I think the more supply there is, then um, the less upward pressure there's going to be on house prices. But um, nothing's going to change until we move away from this collectivist uh, approach to more sort of a market-based approach where the pilot is put in charge of the aircraft and he flies his plane how he likes. There are more than enough rules that, that cover that situation you know you don't need you don't need all the regulation 
We certainly managed quite well before the Care Quality Commission, for example. I mean that, and you can easily say that that's not that good. Not for your average dental surgeon, anyway. it might be for your local hospital, I don't know. Your local health authority, but not, not for your local, um, not for your one-handed dentist. No. So, but I think we've still got a long way to go on the collectivist approach. I think we're only, we haven't even got to peak collectivist yet. It's still going to be a while before we get there. So, uh, but I'll, um, you know, it won't really bother me, but um, perhaps it'll bother you. I don't know, perhaps I'll still be around. I probably won't. Okay, uh, nice to talk to you. Have a good day. Bye.